So remember from way back in chapter 10 that ketones and aldehydes undergo bromination at the alpha carbon when they're treated with molecular bromine, or BR2, in the presence of an acid or a base. Now, for those reactions to work, the alpha carbon must be deprotonated to become nucleophilic. Okay, and so you can see that shown kind of right here. Um, in a carboxylic acid, deprotonating the alpha carbon really becomes unfeasible because the most acidic proton is the one that's part of the carboxylic acid group right here. Now, so this kind of plagued chemists for a little bit. And a clever solution to this problem is to temporarily convert the carboxylic acid into an acid halide and carry out the bromination of the acid halide instead. Now, bromination works for an acid halide because without the acidic uh, carboxyl proton, the alpha protons are the most acidic. So basically what we do is by replacing the OH here with a BR, now this is the most acidic proton at the party. Um, so incorporating bromination in this manner is the basis of a reaction called the hell volhard zelensky or sometimes abbreviated as HZV reaction. Um, and we're going to look at some examples of that on the next page. Um, this was named after three people who, who worked on this. And you can see there's uh, Volhard and Zelensky. And then I cannot find a picture of hell to save my life. So you get some flames. There we are. Um, so let's look at this reaction. Okay. So when we look at the HVZ reaction, what we see happening here is... Um, that we have Br2 and PCl3, okay, um, added as the, the reactant. Now, I want you to see something here. There's PCl3 here, but you can also add solid phosphorus and carbon, te carbon tetrachloride. Um, <clears throat> you almost never see this uh, because it's really hard to buy solid phosphorus. Um, it's a lot easier to buy PCl3. So solid phosphorus sometimes, you know, explodes in air and those types of things. So we just avoid it um, most of the time. Now, in both cases, regardless of what you're using, uh, PBR3 is produced, okay? And that's responsible for converting the carboxylic acid to an acid bromide. So I want us to look at this mechanism. Now, here's one of the kind of neat things about this mechanism is that you already know parts of it. And so you can go through and you can practice this. Um, and I really encourage you to be able to do this. So we start with a carboxylic acid, okay? And we react with PBR3 and there's multiple steps and you can refer back to section 23.4. Right, and now we have an acid halide here. Um, this then, in two steps, right, goes and forms the enol, okay? And that is what reacts with the Br2 through an SN2 reaction. Then there's a proton transfer, and then it undergoes hydrolysis, which again, are multiple steps in section 23.1. And so you end up with a carboxylic acid. Now, if I were to ask you to do this mechanism on a test, I would expect you to go from here to here and show these steps. So you need to go through and you need to refer back to what we just talked about in the previous slides, as well as chapter seven. This is just keto enotontomerization, right? And show all the steps to go from here to here. So we're applying what you already know to a new mechanism. Now, because the Br- minus is a really excellent leaving group, alpha bromo acids are used synthetically as intermediates um, all the time. So for example, um, when we look here at this equation, they can be used to synthesize alpha amino acids like phenylalanine, 
by a nucleophilic substitution reaction with aqueous ammonia. So see how we've had the bromine here and now we've got ammonia here. Um, so very useful in synthesis. Now we're gonna continue on in this chapter and we're gonna look at sulfonyl chlorides with the synthesis of mesylates, tosylates, and triflates. Um, and so we have to kind of define what those are. And so we have a sulfur here, and this is a mesyl chloride, right? Um, where, well, that's the common name, but it can be methyl, methane sulfonyl chloride. Um, so we've got the methyl group here and then the chlorine, and then the sulfur. And you can see this is the trifluoro chloride or the trifluoromethane where we've got the fluorine here. And then this is the para-toluene sulfonyl chloride, also known as tosyl chloride, which a lot of times is abbreviated as tosyl CL. I see tosyl chloride the most. Um, and it might be because sometimes it's used as a protecting group, um, but this, this is what I see the most frequently. So these three compounds are sulfonyl chlorides, um, and when one of these sulfonyl chloride shown here is treated with an alcohol, a sulfonate ester is formed, okay? And this is called a um, sulfonylation reaction, okay? Um, now, let's look at the mechanism for the sulfonylation reaction. So the first step is it's going to go through a nucleophilic addition reaction. Right, which is right here. And what we see happening here is that this oxygen is going to come and attack the sulfur. Now it attacks that sulfur because it's partially positive because those oxygens are withdrawing electron density. And so this electron goes up there. Now, then we have R prime OH, positive charge there. With our CL there double bonded to an oxygen. Now, sulfur can have an expanded octet, okay? So this is the first time we've, we've, um, we've really used something with an expanded octet, so I just want you to be aware of that. Then we have the second step here, which is a proton transfer. And our friend pyrimidine is coming back. to help with this proton transfer. So we're gonna grab it, that proton, those electrons are gonna go there. And so then, all right, what we're gonna see happen is those electrons go there and that chlorine leaves there. And we undergo a nucleophilic elimination reaction. Okay. And we end up with R prime here. Just like that. Now, there is, so this is something that's kind of, um, <clears throat> So, so maybe one of the questions is, why would you do this? Well, look, sulfonation of an alcohol converts a poor OH minus leaving group into a very good R S O three minus leaving group. 
Um, it's that leaving group um, is resonance stabilized when it leaves. So it's really, really great. Um, the few things here, uh, there is significant evidence suggesting that these sulfonation reactions proceed through an SN2 mechanism, but there's also strong evidence supporting the nucleophilic addition elimination reaction mechanism. And so this particular book settles this down right here in the nucleophilic addition elimination mechanism reactions. Um, but there's still some, some really significant questions in the organic chem chemistry community about where these really belong and the mechanism that this undergoes. And they're studying that with things like rates and, and all of that type of information that we've talked about previously. So this very well could be one of those things that right now the evidence supports nucleophilic addition elimination mechanisms, which is what you're learning. But in 15 years, as new techniques come out, I might be teaching this as an SN2 mechanism, right? So I just like to make like that asterisk there. Um, I want you to notice here, right, that no bonds to the carbon OH are broken or formed. And so this also means that this occurs with the retention of configuration at the COH, right? So whatever that kind of alcohol has there, it's gonna stay there as well. Um, so let's, let's look at a specific example as we talk about stereo here. So here's the specific example. So we have the sulfonation of an alcohol um, and what happens here right, is notice right here, this is an optically active center, right, and when it undergoes this reaction, that stereochemistry stays the same, okay, so that's one of the things to, to be aware of here.